The Caucasus region is a mountainous landmass between Europe and Asia, which has long fascinated artists. From Pushkin to Tolstoy, it's a preoccupation which perhaps reached its peak in the 1970s, when the Soviets looked to wipe out entire cultures which had existed there for centuries. In this way, these films can be viewed as a kind of microcosm, a clarion call, or the death rattle of folk culture as a whole, as globalization threatens to eradicate the notion of cultural identity, identity which necessarily is bound to the landscape which produces it. Tengiz Abulatsi's 1976 film The Wishing Tree seems like a good place to start. It's what we might today call an anthology film, a series of interconnected stories set in a pre-revolutionary Georgian village. It's based upon the work of Georgi Leonetsi, a writer who rejected the concerns of his contemporaries, many of whom were pandering to the authorities. The subject in these stories is the world of the author's childhood, the woods and the rivers and the fields, a time when spirit and nature were interchangeable, a time when the earth laughed with flowers and the sky with stars. There's a scene in the middle of the film where the village anarchist explains to the local children how the coming railways will change their world forever. Yo, <laughs> Kali tavi suplat gai vlis garet. Chuena puri sada winis momkani khalki vart. Khilat vikot khilat emant. Es maksar tamo ulot khali. Ager imat mo varot. Imat mo eperot. Why For psychiatrist Ian McGilchrist, this conflict between nature and industry, between tradition and modernization, is symptomatic of what he might refer to as left hemispheric dominance in the brain. In his book, The Master and His Emissary, McGilchrist posits that the collapse of all major civilizations occurs when the more practically oriented left side takes precedence over the right, an area of the brain better equipped to understand reality at a deeper, more cohesive level. For the brain, and by extension societal order as a whole, to function healthily, the right hemisphere must remain the master. It's more suited to that job. The left hemisphere, meanwhile, is equipped for more logical thinking, for wielding tools, for example, skills that allow us to manipulate our environment, essential to our survival on a practical level. But this left hemisphere must always remain the emissary, subservient to the master right. For as long as the relationship remains like this, societies, civilizations thrive, However, when the emissary starts running the show, problems arise. The left hemisphere prefers the impersonal to the personal, and that tendency would be instantiated in the fabric of a technologically driven and bureaucratically administered society. The impersonal would come to replace the personal. 
There would be a focus on material things at the expense of the living. Social cohesion and the bonds between person and person, and just as importantly between person and place, the context in which each person belongs, would be neglected, perhaps actively disrupted as both inconvenient and incomprehensible. In later chapters, McGilchrist charts the gradual shift from right to left hemisphere dominance that took place during the twilight years of the Egyptian and Roman empires. Indicators that this process is underway include a decline in religion and spirituality, an increase in political disharmony, and, most relevant here, an increasing mistrust of the natural world. A mistrust which soon gives way to fear. A fear which itself inevitably gives way to the attempt to dominate and subsequently destroy it. The kind of mechanistic ideology which was about to put an end to the simple life of the characters in the wishing tree was, quote, a world in which competition is more important than collaboration. It's a future in which nature is a heap of resources there for our exploitation, in which only humans count. And yet humans are only machines in a world stripped of depth, colour and value. When I started writing this, I promised myself that I wasn't going to mention Parajanov's jail term. Trying to draw too many parallels between the lives or private lives of artists and their work is unnecessary. There is such a thing as the art spirit, which inhabits or possesses a so-called great artist for a period. Creative greatness ensues. Genius, even. Sometimes the possession can last a number of years, sometimes for the artist's whole career, but then they're dispensed with. The human vessel which is left behind is almost irrelevant. However, I'm going to ignore my own advice here. Sergei Parajanov is one of those singular filmmakers. Like Nabokov in literature, his work is an end point of something. It's the culmination of a particular tradition that probably stretches back to a time when we first started using written language or composing images on cave walls. You can imitate it, but you can't develop it. You can't take it further. Some have tried, but really, after Nabokov and more relevantly after Parajanov, all you can do is start over. Anyway, in 1974, the Soviet authorities sentenced the director to five years of hard labour. Perhaps more so than any other filmmaker of the period and place, or of any period or any place, Parajanov's work celebrates the distinction, the uniqueness of a select group of peoples, peoples connected by the singular universality of their shared environment. And presumably this wasn't permissible. Not in that world stripped of depth, colour and value. For McGilchrist, in such a world, quote, there would be a depersonalization of the relationships between members of society and in society's relationship with its members. Exploitation rather than cooperation would be, explicitly or not, the default relationship between human individuals and between humanity and the rest of the world. Resentment would lead to an emphasis on uniformity and equality, not as just one desirable to be balanced with others, but as the ultimate desirable, transcending all others. As a result, individualities would be ironed out and identification would be by categories, socionomic groups, races, sexes and so on, which would also feel themselves to be implicitly or explicitly in competition with and resentful of one another. Paranoia and lack of trust would come to be the pervading stance within society between individuals and between such groups and would be the stance of government towards its people. There's no better example of Parajanov's rejection of this new, modernistic and totalitarian world order than in his treatment of time. One particular motif in The Colour of Pomegranates illustrates this beautifully.
The slow swinging motion of the character, present simultaneously in childhood and in maturation, is like a metronome. It's an image that negates any sense of linear historical progression, a precondition for state-sanctioned socialist realism. Instead, it suggests a kind of alternative time-space of rhythmical repetition in which past and present co-align. In the world in which Parajanov cinema belongs, time is not linear, more a gradual unfolding. No beginning, no end. Like nature, it moves cyclically. All things are fluid, writes Ovid. Every image forms as it wanders through change. Time is itself a river, in constant movement, and the hours flow by like water, wave on wave, pursued, pursuing, forever fugitive, forever new. That which has been is not. That which was not begins to be. Motion and moment, always in process of renewal. Not even the so-called elements are constant. Nothing remains the same. The great renewer, nature, makes form from form, and oh, believe me that nothing ever dies. In The Wishing Tree, it is difficult to distinguish the characters from their surroundings. For they're more than characters, they're archetypes. What might once have been called spirits. There's the witch here, the holy fool, and in particular the central character of Marita, Mother Earth, an embodiment of the splendour of the natural landscape and, ultimately, tragically, a mirror for its corruption. And its salvation? Nothing retains its original form. But nature, the goddess of all renewal, keeps altering one shape into another. Nothing at all in the world can perish. Things merely vary and change their appearance. What we call birth is merely becoming a different entity. What we call death is ceasing to be the same. Though the parts may possibly shift their position from here to there, the wholeness in nature is constant. So maybe there is hope for us, just as there was ultimately hope for those living under communism. Once we've eaten ourselves, or each other, or eaten each other then ourselves, once we've smashed our bright gem of a planet to bits, maybe then we'll return in some other form. Maybe we won't. Or maybe we'll never have left at all.